Hello and welcome to the Commonweal Policy Podcast. I'm Craig Dale. I'm the Head of Policy at Commonweal. This is episode 86 of the podcast. And this week we're joined by a very special guest. We're joined by Keith Baker, a member of Commonweal's Energy uh, Working Group, who is now a repeat guest on the podcast, having last been on on way back in 2019 on episode 18 of the podcast. It is getting bizarre that this thing's been going that long. Hello, Keith. How are you doing? Hello, yeah, good to see you again. But, uh, <laughs> last time it was in the office, now it's by Zoom. Yes, we're, well, we're, we're all um, completely adapted to, to working from home now. I've got my little space in my, my tiny house. Uh, and yeah, I'm quite comfortable here now. Saves me on the commute, which is uh, <laughs> a, a blessed relief for all concerned. Now, Keith, you were la- when you were last on, we were talking about what was then your upcoming campaign for a Commonweal policy, the, the case for a Scottish Energy Development Agency. Do you just quickly w- want to tell us what that was initially, and then we can t- we can tell folks how how that campaign has been has been going since then. Well, the idea of the Scottish Energy Development Agency is that we need a coordinated strategic national approach to planning our energy um, generation and infrastructure. And that has to be a strategy that puts the poorest and the most deprived first. And that's predominantly people in deprived rural areas. You know, parts of Fife, not up up the road from me, you know, here in Inverkeething. The towns that were that have been depopulated partly by by the shift towards the central belt, by the loss of um, traditional industry, and they're also the places where there is the largest amount of potential for um, developing new renewable energy, and particularly district heating, the district heating and cooling. And where the the idea from the CEDA started is the work I was doing with with Ron Mould, who's also in the energy group and also a member of uh, uh, also sort of a member of staff at Glasgow Caledonian where we, we looked at the most complicated form of low carbon and renewable um, energy system, which is district heating, because you're combining infrastructure with multiple technologies, generation, heat storage. Uh, we looked at what the Danish, uh, well, sorry, what the Danes have done um, with their development of district heating, particularly um, incorporating large scale solar thermal into seasonal heat stores, and then a mix of other technologies, um, including things like biomass, heat recovery, sort of location appropriate stuff. And then sort of realised from there, that if we're going to get this to take off, we need to do something along the lines of what the Danes have done. Um, we need to encourage um, co-location of sources of supply and demand. So the Danes introduced um, a heat supply act but way back in 1979 um, and staged that in, um, not just an overnight change because, you know, this is big, complicated stuff and it can't happen instantly overnight. We have to build the industry. Um, the DHS industry in Scotland is, is really small at the moment. In Denmark, it's now enormous, but it's taken time. So we thought, right, well, OK, what do we need to do that? And how can we bring that into um, incorporating all forms of uh, renewable and low carbon energy development and the supply chains as well? Because if you think of something like biomass, it's controversial um, and there's good biomass and there's bad biomass. But the good stuff is the local sustainable forms. So from, from local woodlands or local forestry. And again, that's largely what, where the Danes started. They actually started way back in around about 1900 using waste from a paper processing plant in Copenhagen. And from that, we worked with um, Ramble, the big engineering consultancy who've been um, instrumental in most of the Danish projects and developed a list of criteria. Um, that was published in the Just Warmth report. But alongside that, we were doing the work on the, on the National Energy Company and the two sort of overlapped a bit. And we came up with the, the obvious need for a national body or a national agency to coordinate all this and to, to bring in specialist technical expertise into the Scottish government um, and to be able to uh, allow local authorities to access that. Yeah, just, just to get us to the next level. Um, because at the moment, it's very, very easy to do what Scotland's good at, which is things like building wind turbines. They're not difficult. But when we're talking about having an energy revolution that doesn't leave anybody behind, um, we need a strategic approach. We need to. We need. We've got to accept that people are going to be leaving the fossil fuel industry if we don't tackle. You know, if we're going to tackle climate change, the fossil fuel industry has to be managed into a terminal decline. And the last thing we want to be doing is, you know, leaving all those skilled employees with nowhere to go. And we want to create jobs as well and create new opportunities for communities. And again, this sort of feeds back into our work looking at rural areas and deprivation there. So that's where it all started coming together. And the idea for the CEDA was born. And then we looked at how it would work with the National Energy Company so that the, you know, the NEC would be a 
developer, whereas the seeder would be a you know a planner effectively. So that kind of takes us up to probably July, August 2019. We then get to October 2019 and uh, a motion went to the SNP conference to, to create this, to create this, this energy development agency. And it passed by an overwhelming majority. I, I remember both of us immediately getting on the phone to each other to, 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 to shout about it as soon as that, that vote went through. That was obviously a couple of years ago now. What's happened with the, with the campaign and with the development of this agency since then? Not a huge amount, but we are making progress. I mean, funnily enough, you say we were on the phone to each other. I was just about to give a lecture at that point, and I was actually going to mention the National Energy Company and the CEDA in the lecture, and I sort of ran into the lecture and went, we've done it! Um, <laughs> and it was like, okay, students, I'll, I'll tell you that at the end. Um, but this, <laughs> yeah, this is the joy of doing research and teaching. I'm able to say that we've been working on something, and at the end, I'll tell you what it is. But as well as the SNP um, conference endorsing it. And um, we have to thank Ronnie Cowan, Stuart McMillan and Chris Hanlon um, for that as well, who gave a lot of support. And Agnes, um, whose surname I'm temporarily forgetting, who's in the Inverclyde branch. Um, so there were a good number of people behind it. We then had the, the Scottish Greens, um, including it in their um, Green New Deal um, for their uh, Westminster election manifesto. And we had the New Economics Foundation um, they published a report re- re-energizing manufacturing and it, the establishment of the CEDA was their top recommendation. Mm. Um, so that's where we sort of, we hit a peak. And then of course, you know, soon after that, the virus started hitting. Um, yeah, that was, go, it seems such a long time ago. Yeah, um, yeah. So there's been a bit of a pause as there's been on the National Energy Company as well, but we've still been sort of plugging away behind the scenes, um, speaking to politicians, um, trying to gain a bit of cross-party support. And I think we're now sort of with, with Nicola announcing, you know, last yesterday, t- today, sorry, um, that the, NEC, the, the National Energy Company is back on the agenda. Now's the time that we can start ramping things back up. Um, so it's not gone away. Um, we've just had to work around things. Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, the, the second part of this puzzle, uh, they are in the form of the National Energy Company. And this is, a, a, again, it's been a, another, another one of Commonwealth's campaigns, largely uh, spearheaded by the energy group and yourself um and it's been running kind of in parallel to this um as you say that the, the the previous proposal was paused largely due to the, the the virus um but there are hints that have come out of first minister's questions today as we record this that it could be back on the agenda can you tell us just again briefly what your vision of the, the NEC is compared to what the government's vision at least was before they paused the program? Well, the last, start with the, the government's position. The last thing we heard from them, and we have had meetings with them, um, was that it would be a retail energy company, which means a company that buys um, energy from energy generators and sells it to the public. And, you know, as many people will know, there are a lot of these retail energy companies around at the moment, and quite a few have gone under. Um, so we don't see that as being much of an advance, you know, any, any different to any of these other companies. The, the critical thing, and this is what's been in our vision right from the start, is that the NEC has to own assets. Um, it has to own its own infrastructure. It has to own its own generation assets. And, you know, that's wind turbines, that's, you know, um, solar, solar farms, all, you know, all the, all the technologies. Because if not, if we don't do that, then... It's quite easy for um, for the for a REIT company to, to go under. And what happens there? Whenever you set up one of these companies, you have a second supply. In. So the case that your company does go under, your customers then get transferred to some other company. That doesn't solve any problems. If you own assets and you've got a, a manufacturing industry building those assets as well, you're getting your money. It's much more secure. You're building up capital, both in terms of financial capital and in terms of physical capital, the stuff in the ground. And, and that gives you a lot more security and you can build on it. And we need these things to be you know, manufactured in Scotland by companies that if they're not strictly Scottish or at least paying their taxes in Scotland. Mm-hmm. Um, as we've seen with what's, with what's happened in Bifab, as I understand it, it's largely owned by a Canadian company. So that's not all the taxes coming back to, the, you know, to our pocket. And that gives us a robust cure way forward. Um, we should be, as a country, one of the for our size, one of the most significant energy generators in Europe. We have that capacity. We're in a unique geographical position. Um, so why on earth we are not capitalising on that is beyond me. 
Yeah, I mean, this is something that we found in when we were doing research for for our Green New Deal blueprint, the the Common Home Plan. I, I remember when I was I was doing the maths behind the 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 prospective energy budget for Scotland, just actually how much potential there is in this country to create the energy that not just that we need, but if we get to that potential, that upper end, and just how much there is to export as well. Um, so we've now got these two organisations. Let's say we, 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 can, we can get them both running at the, the potential that they individually can do. Where's the real, the, the, the real game here? What, what, what does it look like when they start working together? Well, that's it. It's it's that it's those cumulative benefits, and with the national infrastructure company, another Commonweal policy that we've had support for. Yeah. Um, you know more about than I do because that's more your um, side of things. But actually, getting things you know working working in harmony. Um, and one of the things I love about the relationship between the the national infrastructure company and the Cedar and the and the national energy company is we can do away with people so, uh, with people having their roads dug up multiple times. Um, you know, the common complaint that, you know, one day the, somebody comes around and digs up the road for the gas mains and the next it's the electricity cables and the next it's the water pipes. Well, if we bring all that under one uh, under one banner under the NIC, you know, the pipes and the cables in the ground, then it's much easier to go to people and say, well, OK, you're going to get a week's worth of disruption while, you know, while we dig up your road. But after that, you know, that's it. Then that's in the ground and it's done. Yeah, for me that that was that's another big part of how to make the the green new deal efficient uh, when we're deploying it. Because right now, a lot of the onus has been put on individuals to make the changes that we might have to need, especially when it comes to retrofitting their homes. Um, where you know you you might be told right you need to decarbonize your heating by X date. Uh, I'm currently on an oil boiler, um, so I might be, might one day be told right before before X date. Uh, 2030, 2035, whatever it is, you will have to rip out this this oil boiler and replace it with something that is carbon free. And I don't have a huge number of options if I'm doing it myself. I don't have the roof space for for solar panels, for instance. Certainly can't put a wind turbine up in my front garden. So that only really leaves someone like me with maybe an air source heat pump, which um, in your papers, Keith, you've, you've talked about where, where they can work, but also where they don't deliver uh, the, the potential that they could. What I can't do is go out and dig up the road and install a district heating system myself. Um, and, and that's where we need that national collective effort to be able to do these big infrastructure projects. This is where things like the National Infrastructure Company can, can excel. They can sort out the training and the supply chain and the materials to, to make all that happen. I think only the Greens at the moment are, are the, they're the only party in Parliament who who kind of get the point that if you want to do this mass retrofitting that we need, then the best way to do it is to target an entire street or an entire community and do it all at once. I think everybody else is still looking at that individual side of things. So who knows, maybe with the, the new arrangements in the Parliament, we might we might see some some more, more discussion along those lines. Well, that's another good point, actually. If you're dealing with um, tenements, particularly when you, if you're talking about getting air source heat pumps installed on tenements, which may or may not be an option, one of the biggest costs for retrofitting tenements and other communal buildings is the insurance on the scaffolding. Scaffolding, if you're, you know, that way inclined, is quite a profitable industry if you go around pinching it and selling it to scrap merchants. So, not only do you, you're saving your costs by erecting the stuff once paying your insurance costs once and the economies of scale that go with treating you know however many flats on a, a long row of tenements all in one go um, and then another advantage um the energy companies are very not all of them but some of them are very very good at getting into customers homes and we do have the energy saving trust and change works and organizations that perhaps don't do really what they might say they do who don't have those that technical expertise, which is another reason why you know why the CEDA has to develop over time and um, to bring in that technical expertise into the heart of government because it's currently not there. The the guy who he who heads the heat networks team is on less money than me, and if he was working for an engineering consultancy, would be on probably double what he is now and would not be that senior. We can't afford to pay for these sort of very, very technically skilled people in each individual or local authority. Um, they won't necessarily go there anyway, short-term projects with, with you know, minimal 
um, job security when you know I can sign up to be a, in, to a big consultancy like Rambles or Langs or you know Acom um, all the others, and you get all that you know long term job security in nice paying conditions. So you start off small, you centralise it, and you put those members of staff you know who you brought in centrally in touch with individual projects, and that way you can learn from each other as well. But then also on the ground. One of the only good, possibly the only good thing about the Green Deal plans is actually getting, it's an opportunity, sorry, not the Green Deal, smart meters. It's actually an opportunity for engineers to go and visit people in their homes, people with, you know, a good technical understanding of the technologies who are in a much better position to inform um, and help customers and clients. Um, I insist on the word client for anybody who's feel poor because energy is an essential service and they are a client of it. So, yeah, getting, getting that level of skilled, knowledgeable people into people's homes who can go, right, okay, well, you know, that's not going to work, but this will work and this is how you can do it. You know, you may have some funding available as a company through the various schemes or you may, you know, you'll, you'll know your roots. Um, and we, on that front, we also need means-tested grants up to 100% for retrofitting. In, in the old disastrous Green New Deal that Westminster launched, it was loans-based, it was tied to the big six, and we all know the problems that went along with that. Um, you, you are not going to get fuel poor and vulnerable people's properties up to standard unless you are willing to pay 100% of those costs in yeah. the most extreme circumstances. And you might also look at offsetting that, uh, sorry, not offsetting it. You might also look at encouraging people with reductions in council tax for improving their homes. Maybe not long term, short term, you know, we can have that debate. It really, really does come down to money, 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 followed by people being aware of what's out there um, and confident, you know, you're not going to make a big change to your home. You're not going to you know, give somebody permission to come and drill holes through pipes in your new home, unless you're going to be very, very confident it's going to work. And, you know, air source heat pumps are a good example of where for a lot of properties, you might find that because they don't work so well, I'm not saying they don't work at all before anybody shoots me down for this, but they're very, very well suited to certain types of homes, whereas district heating systems are going to be more suited to others and ground source heat pumps will be more suited to others. And OK, everybody who's got the roof space should have solar thermal panels on their roofs and solar PVs, but not everybody has the roof space. So getting more and more individual solutions and the, the difference with district heating, of course, is you need to target groups of properties. And that's where the level of complexity goes even higher. So it, it's kind of the retrofitting at scale problem writ large, but it's all solvable. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 this is one of the things that I've called for for the Scottish government to do as a matter of urgency as part of the Green New Deal plan is to start surveying houses and land to find out you know, what exactly is needed and what can go where. Uh, we can't just have a blanket legislation that says, right, all houses need to be improved to EPC level C or B or A or whatever in terms of energy efficiency by X date without appreciating that Every, almost every building out there is, is going to be different in terms of its condition, its materials, its situation. What we really need is someone to go around and, and do a proper home report on every house and find out what this house is capable of being upgraded to. Can, can it be upgraded to passive level efficiency? If not, well, how high can it go with, before the costs get prohibitive? And can we offset that by, can it take solar panels to, to, to get it the rest of the way? And this is something that we can do before we put any, lay down even a single metre of district heating pipeline. So while we're training up people through the National Infrastructure Company to, 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 to start preparing for those district heating systems and, and all the upgrades, shouldn't we work out where they need to go? Well, and there you mentioned the elephant in the living room, which is uh, energy performance certificate. Um, <laughs> yes, I, another, another one yeah, of your papers, well, Keith. Yeah, running battle with the Scottish government that we currently produce the, the nice little energy labels that you get when you when you go to sell or rent out your property that are not worth the paper they're written on. For anybody who's had a home survey, you'll, they'll know that the amount of surveying work that a surveyor does at the moment um, is pretty limited and these you know yeah. and even the most you know we're talking qualified surveyors here not 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 the staff volunteers who come around and do what we call a home energy check which is basically an awareness raising exercise somebody who's got well they they will probably have done the city and guilds in energy awareness that's not a proper training that's not that's not the level of training that would enable you to go into somebody's house and confidently tell them the sorts of improvements they need to make but epcs are based almost entirely on model data. 
and we've been kicking the Scottish government for this for years. This is long before I got involved with Commonwealth Wheels, stuff me and my team been doing since at least 2012. In that alternative approach paper, we put out, that's something that we put out, and the focus was not using model data, but using real energy consumption data. And we can get this. The Scottish government will claim a bit maybe that, that there are difficulties in, in getting access to that information, but it is actually collected by Westminster, it's collected by the energy companies. Um, or we can get, you know, increasingly with smart meters, we can get people to report it as part of their, you know, home report packs. Um, okay. Now we are being led to believe that there is a consultation on EPCs coming out over the summer. And one of the things that the Scottish government are considering doing is including in that a rough description of a household circumstances. So it's not just enough to say, you know, my energy bills last year were however much, um, because different households have different makeups, you know, adults, children, working patterns, that kind of stuff. Um, and you're never going to get it exact. You're never going to be able to say that, you know, a new household moving into this property is going to be using X amount of energy a year. But you'll know what your lifestyle is and you'll be able to relate that to another person's lifestyle and you'll have an idea. It's not great, but it's a recommendation that we put forward in that um, EPC's report. And it looks like the Scottish government is minded to go on that front. It also looks like they're minded to look at the list of recommendations that come out of an EPC, most of which you will know if you've had one of these reports done and they come out with a long list of things that you could do. And you can look down that list and go, well, that's clearly not appropriate for me. And neither is that or neither is that. So they're looking at getting some sort of change to that that will weed out the stuff that's obviously wrong. But ultimately, we're never going to do this unless we get proper trained professionals in to do full building surveys. So if you, good example, if you get a survey done, see if the surveyor goes up to your loft. Um, a lot of surveyors won't cite health and safety rules for it. When I, had, when I saw my last house, the surveyor, she didn't go up into the loft, even though we had a fixed loft ladder. It wasn't climbing up on, a, on a, a loose ladder. It was actually, you know, one of these pull down things. And she also put in the report that the front wall had a fillable cavity, to which I pointed out that you could tell where the vent was and you could tell by the type of the wall and a few other things that it was clearly not a fillable cavity. So we got that scrapped off. But that only happened because that's what I do for a living. And I was like, well, you know, you know I, I teach people who are, building, who are going to be building surveyors. But ultimately, we will not solve the real problems unless we get full reform of EPCs, looking at real data. Um, and particularly for something like district heating. Again, I know it, we keep coming back to this example. But one of the big problems with a lot of district heating systems is that engineers tend to oversize them. If you're an engineer sizing up a district heating system or anything else, the last thing you want is to leave your customers feeling cold in winter. But you'll know this, that an engineer's sort of, their sort of, uh, the, the upper bounds for them are, you know, everybody using large amounts of heating on the right yeah. one day of the year when it drops, to, when the temperature drops to 10 degrees C. Uh, sorry, minus 10. The reality is that happens very, very rarely, if at all. And the moment you start sizing up individual households, you get a cumulative effect, which means that you'll end up sizing a system that, which is vastly bigger than what's actually needed from what the real data would tell you. And then obviously that adds costs, not just to the system, but also the cost of energy to the, the people on it. That's where we need to really refine things. And that goes double if we manage to um, meet or exceed the targets for energy efficiency improvements that we, we should be aiming for. Uh, if we base our district heating systems on heat demand now before we make those improvements, then it will end up being oversized compared to what, you know, once we make everything passive energy uh, efficiency or, or, or close to it. One thing that, that, that we're still missing from this puzzle, and you alluded to it a few minutes ago, is probably the fourth Commonweal campaign that, that links links into this is how to fund it all. Um, and we talked about, we've talked on this podcast many times about the National Investment Bank and how we could use that to to, to fund a lot of it. We won that campaign. It's, it's Commonweal's biggest successful campaign. Uh, so it's the one also that has result, resulted in, the, uh, in an actual physical agency coming into existence. The, the rest are still in progress. Hopefully I'll manage to get everyone back on a future podcast to, to tell us how those agencies are running once they're once they are but the SNEB is running it is not getting up to the the potential that we hoped it would um, right now the National Investment Bank has kind of trammeled by the rules that it's, it's that have been set for it can only spend the money that the, the Scottish government can give it 
it can't attract money from other sources like pension funds. Um, and we've been campaigning strongly for, for the, the bank to, to, to gain that ability. But that segues us into an interesting bit of, of news about pension funds and energy. Just yesterday, as we record this, the Strathclyde Pension Fund, this is Scotland's largest council pension fund, had a motion put in front of it to divest from its fossil fuel investments. It's, it's claimed that up to £500 million of its fund is invested in fossil fuel companies. The council had this opportunity, it was, it was asked, before COP26 comes to Glasgow, can you divest and start the process of divesting from these, these companies and, and, and moving into green, uh, greener sources or, or alternative investments? They have taken a step forward, but not quite where, where we wanted them to go. They have declined to start divesting immediately. What they're going to do instead is assess the companies that they're invested in and assess their plans and their commitments to decarbonize. So one example that was cited in the media was take a, an oil company that is in the process of transitioning into renewable energy. How fast are they planning to do that? Are they doing it quick enough? Could they do it quicker? And the, the fund has warned them that if they don't meet the standards that they're going to set for them, well, the fund might divest from them later. Um, my thoughts on this are that, yeah, that's a welcome first step, but the climate emergency is demanding more of us than single steps. We really should be doing everything as fast and as hard as we can. Keith, where, where, where do you stand on this? Um, well, at the risk of previewing another campaign we might, or another <laughs> push we might have coming up, I think it would be a fantastic idea if in the run up to the COP, the government um, actually took this seriously and said all public bodies are going to divest. I can say this nicely non-controversially here because my university is one of the Scottish universities that has divested. We need to get them all to have divested, um, but we need to get all the public sector pension funds and other investments completely divested from the fossil fuel industry, partly because it's now a really risky investment. Uh, if you look at sure. that Strathclyde pension fund, they've lost something like 49 million because fossil fuel investment now is, it's a risky business. The industry is you know, it's ultimately going to disappear over whatever time frame as soon as possible. So investments in green energy are actually really quite strong. As PhD student, a guy who did his PhD with me years ago down in Leicester actually did some work on this and showed that inverted commas green investments don't necessarily have the big, you know, they don't have the big ups and downs. But if you want a safe return on, you know, safe guaranteed return on your investment, that's where you should be sticking your money. The industry is only going to grow. Um, and at some point, fingers crossed, it will it will ramp up significantly and people will make significant returns. But it's not going down. Um, you're not you know, you're not we shouldn't be exposing public sector pensions to that level of risk. Yeah. Um, so it just makes sense. And yeah, you know, let's push for this year. Um, and we'll have more on this coming from Conwheel, I know, and others that we need to get the Scottish government to say, right, all public bodies are going to divest. And let's make it by the end. Let's make it by the cop. You know, OK. It, it, it will take a while for the you know the bean counters to actually do their work, but let's just say by the by the time the cop arrives, get every public body to have been to commit to divesting, and that takes yeah. money out of the fossil fuel industry, and it actually makes a, it provides a lot of a lot more financial security for those working in the public sector. You can get in touch with your local MSP, and you can write to them and tell them if if this is something you want to happen, you can instruct your MSP to lobby in the parliament on your behalf on that um uh yeah let's make that happen thank you keith for coming on uh this has been a, a, an absolutely wonderful chat really good to have you on again uh, hopefully next time we get you on it won't be quite as long a gap <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's been great talking to you um and just to say to everyone out there who's listening as I usually do at the end of these episodes, just to remind that Commonweal as an organisation, we are entirely funded by folk like yourselves who donate small regular amounts to the organisation. Our average donation is about £10 a month. So if you have enjoyed the policy work that Keith and others have, have done for Commonweal, if you think it's important, if you want to support it, and if you want to support this podcast where we can help get that, that news out to people, then please consider signing up as a donor. For everyone else, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Policy Podcast and we'll be speaking to you again. Take care, everyone.